glad that we were able to do it. So welcome to our session, um, and uh, we're here to talk about um, uh, SWAPE, students working in interdisciplinary groups. And this is sort of a, a unique uh, a program that we developed at Queensboro, and we'd like to share it with you, and we think it's a replicable model that um, uh, can be used in many different environments and using many different disciplines. So um, that's what we would like to share with you. So what is uh, what is SWAG? So we passed out a sheet um, that has sort of our definitions of what of what it is here. So this is our formal definition: students working interdisciplinary group promotes integrative, collaborative learning across participating classes. So students from courses in different disciplines use technology to collaborate and exchange ideas, often asynchronously, while learning to recognize and apply different disciplinary lenses to their thinking. Swig assignments move the classes from a teacher-centered space to a student-centered uh, environment where peers are the audience for learning and dialogue. Okay, so we will be talking about the steps that we use and uh, student sample, sample student work and assignments that we'll share uh, with you. So, why sway? Why did we sort of come up with this, this, uh, this idea of sway? Um, and what we call the silo problem. And uh, very often students come to our classrooms and they're taking a course because they're told it fits into a major or it's the selective that they have to fulfill. And the things are, tend to be very divorced, or separated from each other, and they don't see how their life experiences um, uh, sort of uh, relate to what they're doing in the classroom or how what they're going to do in the classroom they can take out and use the work situation, a family situation, a neighborhood situation. Um, and our students at Queensboro, just to give you sort of a little bit about where we, we're teaching the dynamic there, uh, we have 28% Hispanic population, 49% uh, are not born in the United States, uh, and there's about over 80 languages spoken on our campus. So we have this huge diversity too of students and often they're working and they're racing between family obligations and um, work and, and these types of things. So what we're really trying to do is to make this education relevant to them too outside the classroom. And also to make connections between different disciplines and to see how these can build uh, upon each other um, and enhance each other. So um, one of the things too we think about, you know, using prior knowledge to help internalize what they've learned from the past and the new processes that they're learning with us. Um, and also to give them skills for lifelong learning. Right, so things that they can take outside, uh, outside the classroom. So one of these concepts, integrative learning, um, and that's this is uh, referring to uh, connecting concepts, experience, and skills uh, to understand complex issues or challenges, and to create new knowledge. So uh, with SWIG, we do these sort of integrative projects, which will be um, explained more. Tell my connections between family, community life, prior knowledge. Uh, prior fields of study, their current field of study, um, and across these different disciplines. Yeah, I think. Uh, uh, sorry. I, I think also one thing is future future knowledge as well. We're trying to create an environment where they're learning in a way that enables them to transfer that knowledge to a new situation, so that they can. Okay, well, I did this in English, or I did this in freshman year, and and this is making sense. So the idea of, is is a continuous building of, of knowledge from beginning from high school even elementary school and, and knowledge being this process of adding to rather than encountering completely new material. Yeah, and through the process too, we, we um, add, often ask our students some reflection, which I'll be talking about, to think about what, how could they use this later? How do they see the skills that they're using? What, what can they do instead of thinking that before they leave the classroom? Um, anticipating that. Um, the AAC New has uh, statements that American Association of Colleges and Universities has um, their statements on integrated le learning, uh, two quotes here, students face a rapidly changing, ever more interconnected world in which integrated learning becomes not just a benefit, but a necessity. Um, and then uh, we talked about fostering students' abilities to integrate um, learning across courses over time, between campuses, community lives. Um, these are the things that we're really working on um, and a challenge of higher education today. Um, now, if you're familiar with the AAC News High Impact Practices, how, are people familiar with those? Right, so they have service learning, undergraduate research, writing intensive courses, um, and they have a category uh, known as collaborative assignments and projects. 
and that's what SWEET, SWEET has been sort of um, placed under, shall we say, if we think about high impact practices, and certainly on our campus in Queensboro. And so this was the, the AAC News definition of uh, this area of this high impact practice. So collaborative learning combines two key goals, learning to work and solve problems in the company of others, and sharpening one's own understanding by listening seriously to the insights of others. And so here's where we have this element of SWIG where we have some peer-led learning and feedback and comments that we, uh, that we do. Um, and so especially those different backgrounds and life experiences, and our students certainly are, come from a variety of different um, uh, places in life. Um, and so approaches range from study groups and then of course to team-based assignments and writing to cooperative projects and research. So we'll explain them how, you know, how we uh, have done this sort of with Queensboro, thus SWIG at Queensboro, which is So we want to think about the CAPSWIG processes um, and products that we do. So in a SWIG project, you have two or three different disciplines that come together, often English course. Uh, Julian's an English professor, and I'm an art history professor. Um, and, uh, and they will collaborate uh, on a wiki, in a wiki. And this is where the main sort of communication can take place. We had an Epsilon ePortfolio that we used and um, and then we transitioned to using Blackboard's wikis and now we're getting a different ePortfolio platform that will eventually be used, but um, Blackboard works very well. Their wikis work very well. And they also have other collaborative spaces where you can leave videos and comments for each other um, and that kind of thing. So Blackboard's a very handy um, tool for that. So we use wikis and um, so if the students are working on a particular project they can communicate back and forth on the wiki with each other at any time. So you have this asynchronous capability. So when our students being coming from you know crazy life schedules, they can do it at midnight when they get off of work or when they finally get the computer at home or uh, or that kind of thing. So it's not like they have to be there at a set time. So it works very well into into their schedules. Um, so uh, depending on the different project, and we'll show you the different arrangements or projects. Students can work together to produce content and they can give this feedback back and forth with the wiki and then eventually let's say they're producing um, a PowerPoint show and one of the programs that we use at Queensboro um, to help make a video or digital story um, is Camtasia. We'll let you do an audio um, recording um, and that will be added to the PowerPoint slides and eventually be uh, coming to a movie. I don't know if you'd like to add more because your students yeah. work a lot with that. Uh, I work a lot with that and I've actually found as, as time has evolved and iPhones have evolved, the students are less interested in using the, the uh, software that we offer and they'll just go home and they'll do the whole thing on Apple Movie or they'll do it on Windows or something like that. And we went through this whole process of it's academic computing was sort of insisting that they use this particular software and it just made it impossible. So I, I've come to just Except whatever the student, whatever software the students are familiar with, and what they're using, and what they can create the product in, but we just accept that now. So, but Audacity is certainly a good one because it's free, and uh, Camtasia is a very good program, but it's expensive, so it really works out. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. So they, they, students tend to. We offer them training and skills to make these digital stories. We offer guidelines for using the let's say Blackboard wikis as well. We always have training involved. But if they are more familiar with a different movie making program, they can they can do that. Yeah. And they also tend to be resist, more resistant to PCs, you know, to to, uh, to sitting at a desk with a big screen and a computer. They're now so used to working on their phones that that's where they're doing a lot of their essays. <laughs> which is which is the good news and the bad news. <laughs> Right, um, right, right. You, you know, so I just found to get the product, to get the end product, I have to be more kind of flexible. I just kind of, this is what's required, this is what you need to demonstrate, this is what you need to include in it, and, and go do it, sort of thing. Okay. Um, now, in terms of what they do with sort of a product that they make, um, it can be this exchange that stays in the wiki that they've learned from, they can post their work in, or they can disseminate it either using an e-portfolio platform and putting their project up there as a sort of digital resume. Uh, many of them post projects on YouTube and share with their classmates that way. And so we have some you know, examples of those. Yeah, also I think um, many of the, the SWIG uh, 
Many of the figures find this presentation is an important element of it. It's kind of like the the, uh, the finishing off where you say, well, this is what I've done and, and you share it with the, all the students. And it's actually usually a pretty wonderful moment and it's at the end of the class and everybody always says, oh, I wish I'd known this about you because my students make a personal uh, digital story, as you'll see. And, and it's actually a kind of a very nice culmination to the class. But I think it's an important element of the learning when they put their digital story out and they, so it's like putting themselves out to the class, but also comparing the way that other people approach the project so they really get to see what was going on in the whole classroom. It's a, it's a nice moment in the class. <coughs> Words and concepts of a course discipline while acknowledging the perspective of another collaborating course discipline. Produce meaning visual and or textual commentary about other students' work and feedback in a timely manner. So this is where we have this peer-led learning, give, uh, giving feedback to each other. And then articulating how they contribute to and learn from that interdisciplinary collaboration. So one of the ways that we um, uh, uh, sort of can look at how they are uh, what they, how they understand what they're learning is through reflection. How many people use reflection here? Of reflective practices? We all have some sample reflections. Um, so um, this is sort of the reflection cycle. Um, and yeah, as an art historian, I'm always used to screens and visual <laughs> stuff. So, you know. um, stu your students. So the student comes to your class with a certain experience and certain knowledge that, that students gained um, uh, through their life, through their education. And then um, we develop a pre-reflection assignment that is based on the upcoming SWIG assignment um, to kind of anticipate what their experiences may be. Um, and then to think about, to ask about their prior knowledge in a specific area. So we kind of they think about, well, what am I coming into this with? So it kind of and then uh, there will be an assignment based on disciplinary objectives. So whether it's our history or English or um, science or biology, uh, speech, a variety of different disciplines. Um, and then through the SWIG assignment, they have a sort of social pedagogy, interdisciplinary interaction, gift giving, which happens. Um, and so this is uh, the social pedagogy. So they, they will uh, do their interactions on a wiki. They will uh, be giving each other, let's say, uh, a sound gift, a visual gift, a, a feedback on their on their work. Um, and this gift giving is a key factor too. With a key element of swig is that one student or two students will give something to another student, whether that's an image, whether it's a sound, whether a poem, uh, response, that kind of thing. And then we have. <laughs> The post reflection leading to the sort of final uh, outcome, and so then we design the reflection to look back to the beginning and through the process of what of what they've just learned, and then to also sort of think about how they're going to use what they just learned beyond this beyond the classroom. So a number of these uh, kind of types of questions um, that we'll write. One that I always like to ask is. Um, you've met a new person, a new uh, Queensboro student, and they're going to take the SWIG project. How would you explain to them to be successful with it? So they have to really think about what I do right, what I do wrong, or how I tell someone else to do that better. Okay, the presentation of the final outcome, whether it's a project, um, visual, digital, uh, story, um, that kind of thing. So this knowledge then will goes back into the student experience that they will take on to their next um, assignments, classes, or community. So this is this reflection cycle that um, that we're using. 
Now, um, thinking about student achievement with SWIG, of course, everyone, everyone's colleges, universities want to think about assessment and, and the value of what you're doing. And so we have a number of different surveys that are done, um, uh, and one that was looking at uh, high impact practices and retention and pass rates um, that was calculated from the fall 2010 to 2011 had um, non-SWIG and SWIG uh, courses. And uh, they looked at English 101, the English 101 class specifically, because that was often an element, a course that was, that was linked to another discipline, um, which is English 1 is, is English Composition 1. Mm -hmm. So they looked at the pass rate of, of that course. And um, so the non swing class was 84% and then 95% with the swing class, which is a higher, you know, higher pass rate. So, so we look as engaging the students in a different way. Um, retention, they looked at the retention over a half a year. Were they still there? 80% um, to 90% in the SWIG classes, so non-SWIG versus SWIG. So um, the college likes that, um, of course. And then we had a survey done fall 2012 looking at uh, students by ethnicity. And so what we found is that Hispanic students achieved uh, um, uh, quite highly in a SWIG uh, class. So here we have no high impact practice, 81% to 93% um, when they're involved in SWIG courses. So um, that, of course, is uh, important to us as well. Now, the last sort of survey information that we have, um, last spring, uh, they, in spring 2015, they conducted a survey of all high impact practices at Queensboro, and we're asking them questions about the students about deep learning. So it was looking at students' perceptions of what they were learning in their classes, as opposed to being a statistic. It was really what the students are thinking. Okay. Um, so I will show you. Uh, so some of the results. So the results here are for a non-high impact practice that control with students who were in a SWIG class. And there were a few areas, the ones were highlighted in white, and, then, and they're probably really hard to read. Um, and uh, just give me a picture. So this is where students who were in SWIG sections excelled. So this course encouraged, or let's say their perceptions. This was their perception of what they were learning, because it was a survey given to students. This course encouraged me to reflect on what I learned in the past, when I think about new information and concepts, non-HIP uh, class 83.3% and a SWIG 90.4%. Okay, so students who involved in SWIG were, were seeing that they um, were encouraged to reflect. Um, number six was another area with a high um, uh, sort of understanding by the students. This course included at least one assignment requiring me to put together concepts and facts from different sources to create new ideas. Right, so I think, what, am I creating new knowledge? And a non high impact class, 76%, in the SWIG, 91%. Right, so the students are really seeing that they're producing new knowledge. Um, this course encouraged me to use my personal experiences to understand concepts and facts. So again, the non SWIG, uh, non hip high impact practice, 67. Oh, sorry, 70. 70, sorry, I'm getting lost in the numbers. I hope you're not getting lost. Um, I'll, I'll keep it quick. I mean, we're not restoring this. Is, okay, 75% to 88%. So this is, again, students' perceptions of what um, they're learning. A class activity assigned in this course required me to work with classmates to complete a project. So group work. We know how important collaboration is outside of the classroom in the workplace. In many places, oh, students don't know how to play nice in the sand, but our students are new hires. Employees don't know how to play nice in the sandbox and collaborate well, so this is something also that we'd like to foster. So they see this non high impact class 63 to 80% in SWIG. And then lastly, this class, and so I'm just talking about the ones where, where SWIG excelled. This class included perspectives of people from different uh, backgrounds and cultures. 72 to non high impact practice to 85 in the SWIG class. Right, so these are um, some of the results from some of the survey I have a for you. Do you have any questions before we move on? Yeah. I'll just, I might, you might answer when you move on slowly. Okay. Okay. Well, I just figured it's 11. 
And please stop me here unless if we're talking too fast, I have a question. <laughs> So now, think about students achieving in SWIG. We have some sample assignments and uh, student work, so hopefully this will all uh, now make uh, sense. Okay, this is a project I do with a professor in an English class. I'm gonna pass these around. Um, and it's what we call our scavenger hunt project. And what we do is we work in Blackboard and we put together a PowerPoint with objects that are on view in art museums in New York City. So we've got a plethora of uh, museums. So we put together you know, about 45 uh, different images. And uh, the title isn't there, but there is a link to um, the museum where the object is at. Okay. So uh, the English students then go in and they open up the PowerPoint. And there's about 25 students in each of our classes. So I'm pairing my art history students with the English, uh, English 101 uh, um, students. And so the English students go to the PowerPoint and they pick one art object to write about. It can, some of them are paintings, some of them are sculptures. Um, and so they pick one object to write about, but they don't name what the object is. And they post it into a wiki. Then my students go in and they have to look through the wiki, read the descriptions, and find the object that it matches. All right, so the English students are used to writing about art, so it had to be descriptive. And you should, you should get it. You know, you should find it. Sometimes there's mistakes made, but then my students find the image, they copy it into the wiki, they give feedback to the English students on their writing to so give some feedback. And then my students do a research paper on that, on that project, so they have to do the proper research protocol um, on that art object. They then post it into the wiki. The English students give them feedback, ask them questions, um, and they can respond. And then the English students will um, uh, then pick something to research further. So let's say it's a 17th century Dutch painting, let's say, by someone like Rembrandt, or they can pick clothing of the 17th century to research. So, or something that could be in their landscape paintings or portraiture, or famous uh, individuals. Um, so that, and then this feed that keeps going back and forth so they can understand and reinforce um, concepts from the different disciplines. So I've passed around, this is, the, this is the assignment that I give my students with, to have a description of what it's about. I also have uh, reflection questions, pre and post reflection question samples in there that they do before and after with it, so you can um, take a look at that. What I'm showing you here are samples of the wiki pages where they work with each other. Uh, it's hard to see that object. Yes, please, please add. Uh, I'm really glad that Kathleen included this because each week project has this uh, wiki interaction. I didn't put mine on either, but I personally think a lot of the magic happens there. Because, you know, as you can see, there's different colours. The students use different colours so everybody knows who's working groups, everybody knows who's talking, what's talking. But it's there where the different disciplinary knowledges come together and where people are offering um, their disciplinary knowledge in response to something that the other discipline did. And um, so I think that each each project in SWIG has this incredibly rich interaction between the students in the groups and across disciplines. In my classes, they do it within the class peer review, and then they do it with the outside, which I'll get to. But just to see how there's pictures, there's links, there can be audio, there can be all sorts of things, all in response to the work that the students did. And it's just, it's just a fabulous visual to, to see how rich the, the collaboration is. And one thing too that I found interesting, my students have said to me, you wait, you mean all the other students can see my, my writing? I'm like, well, are you gonna do better on it because of your, your colleagues or wouldn't you as good for me? So it gets them to you know, think about this sort of, I don't know, I hate to use audience. the peer pressure for the audience of who's gonna be reading um, their work. Um, this is another project that I do with, the, with Professor Mann, an English professor. And this is our poetry project, and this is for a literature class that he teaches. And his students take a poem that they're going to analyze. My students read the poems, pick one, and then they find an art object that enhances or responds to that poem. 
Then my students have to do some research on that art object, and then they go back and forth um, sharing uh, comments and feedback um, on that. And everything takes place on a wiki. Um, and then the English students will, at the beginning of the semester, do sort of a, poem, a poetry analysis paper, and my students then give them feedback on that analysis paper. So I'd like to think to you know that it, it's improving both the visual and um, language skills of students in both, in both classes. So these are just examples of some of the wiki pages. Okay, this is, this is a new project I started last semester with a different English professor, um, Bridget Tilly, and it's also in you know, English course. And she had her students read, I always read this book, Persepolis. Have people heard of this book before? Um, this is two, and there's, there's one and two, but we had to read number one, and this is one I had with me. It's a graphic novel, and there's a lot of interest in graphic novels these days. Even MIT Press has a new journal of graphic novels, study graphic novels. And um, so the one that our students read was the first one, which um, uh, it, it's a story of a child living through the Iranian Revolution. And from the perspective of the child, she wrote it when she was older as an adult, but she wrote it from the perspective of how she was feeling and her experiences of the changes that were suddenly taking place during the Iranian Revolution. Now, suddenly she had to wear, she, you know, she had to wear a headscarf. She was like, why do I have to do this now? Uh, you know, and, and it was the, from the perspective of a child of not understanding what's going on, and the assumptions you make, and then being corrected by adults, and going back and forth, so it was really quite interesting. So, I had my history of graphic design students read this. They're digital art design majors, so they are familiar with digital software. Many of them draw very, very well. And um, so, they, um, all, both classes read the book, Then the English students were to come up with a time period. Um, uh, it could be World War One, World War Two, the French Revolution. Somebody picked uh, Black Lives Matter uh, issues, uh, and then um, they made a pitch. And then my students worked in teams. So it's two English, two history of graphic design, and they were to come up with their own comic strip, about ten panels. We said uh, on a particular moment in time, on a particular experience. And so they had to be really creative. They had to work on the text together. And then my art students, they either drew or they used a computer program. So this is one with Black Lives Matter. Um, and this whole sort of conversation of a grandfather talking to a grandkids about meeting Martin Luther King Jr. And, and how that related to what was going on with the Black Lives Matter movement there. Um, and then I had another student here who uh, chose World War II and the bombing of Pearl Harbor. There were another student who did one about the Nazi concentration camp, but this was the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And I thought this was really fascinating because this was a kid who sat in the back of the class, seemed completely disengaged. You know, you kind of you know, tried to pull him in and talk to him. And this project got him. Like he got this, this was something that really that engaged him. And he was so excited to talk about it in class. And so he was a student who was interested in Japanese comics and manga, and he was teaching himself Japanese. So this gave him an opportunity to use that. So he wrote this, um, uh, the bombing here, and then he actually spoke the Japanese words in class. And he was not with you know, Japanese background, you know, Asian at all. And then the talking about Roosevelt and his announcement to the country. And then he used a photograph uh, from uh, the 1940s when uh, Japanese Americans were put into concentration camps. Mm -hmm. Not concentration camps. Uh, not concentration camps. Yeah. 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 Internment camps. Internment camps, thank you. And so there was a photograph that he found. It says, Japs keep moving. This is a white man's neighborhood. Right? So, and then he talked about what was going on. And it really brought that moment, because not every not all students were aware of that moment, but it made it so relevant to today, because we've got crazy people like Trump telling the Mexicans to get out of the country, <laughs> to tell the Muslims that they can't come to our country, right? So it was able to bring in this amazing dialogue about what was happening in the 1940s to what was happening today. So it was really great. It was really, it turned out to be, you know, right now. There were other ones too, but this was, I thought, very, you know, touching for today. Okay. 
Jillian. Um, okay, so my uh, my proposal, uh, my project, which I can hand out, I have a couple of examples. One is older and one is more recent. Um, originally, I worked with speech and massage discipline um, to come up with, uh, for my students to come up with digital stories. Um, and then I began to be more interested in trying to improve the production values of the, of the, um, of the digital stories that they created. So I began a collaboration with um, an, act, an acting professor and a music professor because uh, what my students are trying to do is that they have a choice to either write about their academic identity, you know, um, uh, where they've come from, where they are now, and what, what they hope to do towards an integrated um, academic uh, or academic and professional identity, or they can write about their experience of um, migration, um, because, as Kathy said, uh, it's it's not unusual if there's 30 students to have 30 different nationalities and at least half of the people in any one classroom are not born in the country. If they are born in America, uh, their parents may not have been. So, it's, so my, migration is an experience that shapes almost every uh, student at Queen, Queensborough and many professors such as myself, because I'm an immigrant myself. So what we did in the most recent um, assignment was to um, pair with music and acting. So my students wrote, first of all, we read a lot of uh, personal narratives. Um, you know, there's a textbook, the English department has a textbook and it contains a lot of personal narratives. We read the personal narratives, we discussed them, and then I had them write their own personal narrative on either of those things. Then they posted that on the wiki and the acting students read it aloud. They interpreted and read it aloud and recorded that and posted that back up. The music students took that uh, work and interpreted it musically. In an ideal situation, they were composing. In general, they were offering some other, you know, you know, a piece of music from somebody else. And um, then, as a second, then my students were to, to rewrite theirs and also to adapt it to a script. They, what they do is they take a three-page um, personal narrative and turn it into, a, you know, a one-page script for about a ten-page um, begins of the PowerPoint. And when that was done, when that was finalised and they had exactly what they wanted to have as their soundtrack on their digital story, they put it back on the wiki and the acting students took it and they interpreted that for them. So my students had a choice to either use their own voice or to use the voice of the acting student. It was about 50-50, but the, certainly the reflections that I got, uh, that was a very powerful experience for them to hear somebody else reading their work, you know, their personal essay, and it was especially interesting. Sometimes a male student would read a female student, or a female student would read a male student. So it was it some some of the students really loved that, and some of them were just totally discombobulated by it. So it was interesting. Then they got to choose um, which one. So I, I think rather than talk, I started to show you. Can you say, yeah, which one? So, uh, which one? Jeremy Molina. So this is a, just an example of the sort of product they, they, finish, they finish up with. Uh, no sound. <laughs> Technology. I love it. <laughs> I know, I thought we had this figured out. Yeah. Because I heard sound when we got one. Okay. 
Or maybe we can't, <laughs> maybe we can't hear it. But um, Jeremy, uh, the gist of it was, what I liked about this piece in particular, uh, Jeremy did use his own voice, but um, he talked about his mother's uh, migration from Colombia and the way in which that shaped him, you know, and, it, and shaped his, ex his American experience and also the values and how he integrated American values with, um, um, with um, Colombian values and, and was able to kind of be, a, be at one within the society. But what I particularly like about it is that he took the quote from um, LBJ that, that kind of described America as this place that kind of embraces everybody and he was able to contextualise his own experience within that broader American experience, which I really like. <laughs> Which he, it took him hours and hours to get that exact quote, you know, but we're not going to hear it. But uh, anyway, so that was, a, that was the gist of that one. And the influence of his mother. Um, so, and, he, you know, like in the, everything that she offered him, like the food and the, and the, the value, the struggle that she went through, it was really wonderful. Um, and then right at the end, he brought it right back to JFK and he said, you know, I, I am the embodiment of this experience. So I really like that about it. Um, so that's that one. I don't, I don't get it. I'm here. Do you want to hear some? Um, I don't know. Do you want to hear it? Yes, yes, no. Uh, I'm really sorry about that. I, you know, the, the sound is there. <laughs> Um, if anybody wants it, I can always send it to them. to the United States and go to New York to live with her brother. 
Not knowing any English, she told us stories of being lost in the middle of the city and not being able to get her way home, and also the difficulty of finding a job right away. Not to mention having her first car stolen within the first three months of owning it. Despite these obstacles, never did she give up hope on making things work. She began to learn more and more English and enrolled herself in school and attended Hunter College in New York City. With rent and tuition over her head, she had used what she learned in Columbia to help her push through the rough situations she found herself in. My mother is a clear example of the true nature of migration. Her strong values and relentlessness is what Lyndon Johnson would consider as nourishing the land. If it wasn't for her migration, she would never have passed down her teachings of determination and hard work to her children now living in America. Her children that would now be the future of the country and would be considered Americans. However, she made sure we would never forget where part of our family tree had originated. She made sure that we had learned her native language, Spanish, and fed us with the delicious foods like rice and beans and empanadas. <laughs> These are the things that make me proud of my mother's migration and thankful for the migration of all the others that came to this country to make it the amazing place that it is today. Uh, yes, I thought that was a wonderful example of what, it, what comes out of a sweet class. And um, just as an English professor, it's great to see all those citations. And you know, we haven't cited in the mu any music. He didn't use music. You know, any images, any videos. We're teaching them how to get on to the Creative Commons, how to use other work, how to acknowledge it, how to you know, all of that sort of thing. So that's just a kind of a side thing. I think probably that will do because. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. It's more. <laughs> there are more. Um, we have lots of different examples. We want to leave time to for you to uh, ask questions. Um, what this this here was a part of the common read, uh, and where students in different classes read the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. Has anyone ever are you familiar with the Henrietta Lacks story? Oh yeah. Right. Right. So she her, her cancer cervical mm -hmm. cancer cells have been reproduced, reproduced, and used all around the world, and so it's about this, this story, and uh, so this, the combination of biology, English, and speech work together on different topics related to women's health, and they had to do the research, and, um, and they eventually created digital stories from uh, that after these are sample collaborations on Wiki. Oh, yeah. I really think that wiki part, you know, where it's totally student-centered, student it's student-to-student student peer. Mm -hmm. You know, we set it up, we tell them what to do and what's required, and they do the whole thing themselves. And that is where I think a lot of the learning takes place in that wiki. I really do. Yeah. So. Stats of them made a huge impact in the scientific community. Many patients have taken advantage of this. Some digital stores of the stories were made out of this, depending on the TARS themselves. Stencils are able to self-renew and differentiate into a variety of cell types. There are four characteristics of stem cell. So tipotent. Okay, so you get the idea of what some of these stories were. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, moving to like student reflection, talk about the post-reflection, the final reflection. This is what we see, it's what students have gained. Here's just a few quotes. Um, just isolated. I learned from all the components involved. The research method helped me to broaden my research skills, extended from Google only to specific, from Google only to specific databases and articles. Um, talking about using um, uh, the, with these uh, photo sources, audio, um, using the library database. The wiki taught me to respond in a way that is appropriate for others to view and to make criticisms as well. So talking about the things that they're learning. Um, and last thing we have, and then you guys can ask questions, we have two different rubrics that we use. One is a collaboration rubric um, that relates to our learning outcomes that we can use to show the students that this is what we're expecting of you or this is how you can use to evaluate. Mm -hmm. Our faculty then, we're with faculty, can use this as is or they can use it to make their own rubric to do assessment and evaluation. Um, that's their, and then we have another one that has to do with digital, um, the digital project, if they're making a digital story. So I have samples of, um, we have samples of both of those, and so I'll send those around, right? And uh, you can take, take those. So, our contact information, and if you have any further questions. 
Anything else you want to add? Um, no, but just, just to underline that whole thing that Kevin was talking about, they starting at Google. And get, you know, I find a struggle in the, and I've talked to professors from all disciplines, such a struggle to get students out of Google, into the databases, into citation, to really, you know, I, I mean, there's so much information right there for them at the press of, of, of Google. And in fact, when I get my first freshman students, a lot of times the citation is, Google.com. <laughs> so we have work to do there. But um, you know, this project seems to work very well for, for getting for getting that better quality research, getting them to understand sources and you know attribution all that sort of thing. And we also work with the library who makes yeah. on our uh, the library's website at our, our college they have uh, that's included okay. different information sources that's and, that's and that's citation that's formatting. That's Often we take our students also to the library for an information, information literacy class where um, they learn to evaluate sources, ways to find um, resources. So. Question? Yes. Two related questions, actually. Um, how do you know that, um, that this is actually making a difference? I know you saw the delta between the, the control and the, but how do you know that that's not due to, for example, you guys being exemplary professors. Do you have what? So the question is, first question is, what is your sense of, uh, besides anecdotal, of how this has changed how well your students do? And the second question is, what is your college doing to scale this? Because I'm sure they looked at those numbers and said, ooh, and as we were talking before, you have we have to do more of this. How? What are they doing to enable that to scale? Um, and specifically, getting more instructors interested in doing. It? Um, yeah. How do we know? How do we know that they're succeeding? Let's start with that one. How do we know that it's making an impact? I think one of the best places is through the, looking at the reflections and to analyze their reflections. That as a as a professor, you know what they've gained from it, and as well as from the projects that they're producing and the new skills that they uh, are developing that they also then articulate through the reflection. Um, we our SWIG faculty have, go through training. Um, and uh, and we continue to give feedback. We have a leadership group um, that there's so there's two other three of the people who are not here: Barbara Lynch, Kiki Bias, and Lisa Sircone, um, who are also involved in in this. And uh, we do training with new faculty to ensure that um, they can develop assignments. So we do sweet fat training, and then there is. Um, two separate trainings that are run by our Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. One is on backward course design, they call it. So coming with what you want your students to gain from your course and then building backwards. Um, and another is a reflection workshop. So developing you know, effective reflections. So they have to take both of those as well as two workshops in our sway. Now how is our, how is our faculty, what do you want to answer? Well, we which really speaks to the issue of replicable. It's replicable. Rep replicable. In, in that, I've been on the leadership in the, from right from the start, when it first began. And we're now in about the third generation of sweet faculty. So, you, you know, it's a, constantly evolving and developing and, get, oh, we think, getting better, right? But it's still, there's a basic set of pedagogy and the training that Kathy's talking about now. Uh, each faculty member is gone so that, that that pedagogy has a life of its own. I mean, you know, you know it would be wonderful to think it is because we're good professors. I know everybody in Sweden is a very dedicated teacher. But I, I think, as Kathy is indicating by this training, that we have a set of outcomes that we want and, and we're, we're focusing the teachers on, on creating that. And then <coughs> at the back end, retention is, is, is high in Sweden. So, so it's working. I mean, I think the answer to your question is that there's a third generation of sweet faculty achieving the same kinds of results. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, definitely. I, th I think that um, in terms of how the campus is supporting us is um, offering a small stipend for training, going through the training, and and it's so we have right you know, so we have so we have a series of high impact practices, and each of those practices has um, two co-leaders and uh, who facilitate the training um, and feedback. So new faculty in SWIG, then they submit the assignment proposals. We 
give them feedback. They submit reflection questions. We give them feedback, the, the whole leadership team. And uh, so that, that way to we help support them in that sense. Um, I don't know, I hope that answers your question. It does, it answers those questions, yes. Uh, I have like two questions. One is uh, why choosing a particular reason why you choose a week? That's historical. That's to do with the ePortfolio had that wiki function and uh, that it was, um, what was the one before digitation? Epsilon ePortfolio had a, had a really fabulous wiki and Blackboard didn't. And it enabled that interaction and supported multimedia. Um, so that's what we were looking for and, and it was perfect for social pedagogy. You know, the students didn't have to be enrolled in the same class. They could meet on that wiki, you know, in different classes. Then Blackboard's wiki came up with that, um, and so at that same time, Epsilon went broke. <laughs> so <laughs> we were left without a platform. We're moving to digitization, but digitization doesn't have, I don't think it has that opportunity. It has some wonderful features, but it doesn't have that opportunity for social pedagogy. Yeah. No. Um, could I just say behind, um, also in answer to that previous question, Sweep was uh, originally, it was kind of organic, up, up from yeah. the faculty. And, and that's how it developed. And it developed in a very kind of, you know, very organic, organic, grassroots organic way. yeah, grassroots way. And I think that it took a long time for the administ administration to see the value, you know, because for a long time we couldn't explain it. We could just show the results. And as time has gone on, we can now explain it, outline exactly what we do, and show the results in the product. So I just wanted to say that. But yeah, that's that's why. I, Back to you. <laughs> Sorry, I've had about two hours sleep, but um, that's why it was just historical, and it's to do with we need this quality, we need the ability to do this. Why I kept pointing to those wikis is because that's what we really need: is the ability to people to meet asynchronously and to exchange ideas, gifts, and and for it to be totally student-centered. Not you know we're not interfering in that wiki in any way. You know, they're offering each other, and, and as Kathy said, suddenly they realise what they do matters that everybody can see it, you know, and, and that, does that answer your question? We did have one um, faculty member, so an art historian, English professor, who did a collaboration on food in art and literature, and and the English faculty member had built his own website, and what the, stu the students could log into and interact there, had their blogging function and that kind of thing. So, there, you don't have to use them. You could use whatever platform is accessible um, for your students. And do you, is there some, I'm curious, is there something that you can suggest that might be more interesting? No, it's basically, uh, we are a uh, Blackboard administrator at Hostel. So I think we okay. can like, offer a uh, discussion board, but each of them have their own purposes. Like they have the genre and also have the blocks of the case. Well, that's what we want to know, it's the wiki on Blackboard. And the second question was uh, before a student publishes any of those projects to the ePortfolio platform, are they approved by someone or they can do it? Yeah. Right, right. So, so, in, so in the past, they could just post it. Um, there are conversations about, I think that a lot of us are working with students on social pedagogy or any sort of social network platform out there. There's conversations about appropriate content mm -hmm. and how you present yourself. And you need to be very careful about how you present yourself, right? And even if it's, you take it down, someone could take the picture. You see, that sort of enters, usually at some point in the conversation. Um, it's also a useful conversation about professionalizing <coughs> because I think there's a lot of confusion, certainly in my classes, when you're doing a personal narrative and, and understanding that that's actually academic, you know, and what the difference between, and you know, we don't, it's not a confessional, you know. But, right. <laughs> so, but uh, one, one interesting thing that happened to me when I first started and I got them on, on um, um, ePortfolio, I saw some of the students pictures of themselves and they were, you know, in these incredibly provocative, you know, clothes and stances and, and in a way it was good because it did open that conversation up and that conversation is part, it's a, it's a running thing 
and you know, with my son, I'm, I'm really wanting to get them to have a handle on themselves as, you know, having a professional and an academic identity. And so, you know, to me, it's an opportunity. You know, so.